That is the president of the Turkish Canadian Society. I would like to acknowledge that we are holding this event on the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish people. Turkish Canadian Society, also known as TCS, is a non-profit charitable organization founded in 1963. It is one of the earliest Turkish societies in Canada and focuses on arts and culture in general. We also organize events to increase awareness and knowledge on important topics for our members and for the communities we live in. As a society, we cooperate with uh, organizations that share a similar vision with us to help build culturally rich and inclusive societies. The Assembly of Turkish American Associations, known as ATAA, is one of them. We are part of the UN Committee of ATAA, and I would like to acknowledge my friends Zuhal Kavat, Sina Kutlay, and Atakan Şengül from the TCS board as part of this field. The ATAA UN Committee organizes events related to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. The committee has chosen six out of the 17 total pillars to work on, and these are good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, clean water and sanitation, responsible consumption and production, life below water. For this talk, we picked the pillar good health and well-being. In this era of climate change, we thought that learning about and discussing the physical and mental effects of the climate crisis on human health would help our community. We are fortunate that our friends from CAPE, the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment, were able to give a hand for this event. CAPE is a national organization that is involved in promoting health and the environment by engaging with governments, running campaigns, conducting research, and drawing media attention to key issues in this area. Planetary Health Clinics, PHCS, uh, is an initiative started under the CAPE umbrella and are run by healthcare professionals working at the intersection of climate change and health. Now, I would like to invite my friend Zuhal, our Director of Strategy at the TCS Board, to introduce our speakers the two physicians from CAPE who kindly agreed to give this talk. Thank you, Dana. Uh, welcome, everybody. I am honored to introduce our speakers, Dr. Linda Thayer and uh, Dr. Kai Hirani. Uh, they would like to engage us in a discussion of how we can prevent some of the dire consequences of climate change and also how we can better adapt to coming changes. They would like to hear our ideas on how we can move forward together a healthier future. During their presentation, they will be touching on what we can do to protect our health during climate disasters, mitigation strategies to prevent more events and the mental health impacts of climate change, along with some strategies to face our quickly changing world. Linda Thayer is a mother of three and practices family and sports medicine on traditional coast salish territories with a focus on youth over the past 20 years. She is the founding member of Doctors for Planetary Health West Coast and is an active member of various medical environment and peace community organizations. She has a lifelong appreciation of the many nutrition and healing gifts of Mother Earth and works toward restoring health and peace for all. And Thank you. Kai Hirani is a psychiatrist and psychotherapist in private practice. He has been a member of CAPE since late 2021, involved in their various climate action events, interacting with the public to raise awareness on the impact of climate change on health. He has a special interest in the mental health impacts of climate change. Kai's passion and concern for the environment backs uh, to the, his childhood 
uh, work conservation, avoiding waste, and aesthetic compensation along with reuse were promoted. Now I will give the microphone to our speakers, and I hope you will enjoy the presentation. We'll have an engagement discussion at the end. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you, Demet. And thank you so much for inviting us to come to speak to you. This is an issue that we find is really important and we need to be talking about a little bit more. So we'll be talking a little bit about the physical and mental health um, impacts in the, in the climate crisis. Um, and um, I know Demet has already spoken about this, but we just want to acknowledge that we are on the unceded and stolen territories of the Coast Salish people, the Musqueam, and the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh. And we thank them for being stewards of these lands for centuries and stand in solidarity with the work of decolonization. We thank them also for their ancestral and generational knowledge and wisdom and teachings about the land that we're living on and all that it holds. So we thought we'd start off with a little poem that this is a poem written by Dr. Jeff Blair. He's a pediatric surgeon and he's a member of CAFE. And he's just describing the devastation and yet the hope as he visited Medicine Lake near Jasper recently after a wildfire swept through the year uh, through this a few years, years ago. Medicine Lake by Dr. Jeffrey Blair. Yellow smoke from the distant fires obscures the morning sun, having the view of this saddened lake. A loon circles the still water rippling the reflection of the burnt sticks which line the riparian shore. An osprey, wary of me, beats her flight over the blackened trees, and I see her nest atop a, car a charcoal tree, her young on its edge, looking on the only world they know. And yet, throughout this cremated forest, and amidst the gray rocks, the hopeful fireweed flourishes. So we will talk tonight about the phenomena happening now, which are leading to this devastation, how this is impacting our health, and then give you some hope and some strategies to move forward in a good way. So the United Nations Environment Program has named these times a triple emergency of three interrelated but distinct processes. Um, and today we'll focus on climate change in particular. As you can see by this graph, there have been periods of warmer and cooler temperatures uh, throughout history with gradual variations in which the ecosystems could adapt. But there on the right, you see that dramatic spike up. Um, and never has there before been a period of such rapid and dramatic change, and hence the difficulty with adaptation and the problems that we're seeing as a result. There is clear consensus that climate change is caused by emissions from human activity, which are causing the greenhouse gas of raising the Earth's temperature, heating up the globe. These are expressed in the number of particles in the atmosphere that are contributing to the greenhouse um, effect in parts per million. Um, and alternatively, they can also be expressed as tons or megatons in many situations of CO2 equivalents. Some particles have larger or smaller greenhouse effects compared to CO2, carbon dioxide, which allows for a, a way to measure the combined effect of these particles. This is a graph of Canada's emissions, and we can see that Canada's emissions have increased over time with a recent plateauing, still a little bit of up and down, but generally a plateauing over the past couple of decades, and the dip in 2020 when things uh, slowed down considerably. With current measures, we are still way off target, the target to get to our Paris Agreement goal, which is a 30% reduction compared to 2005 levels. We need to get down to 407 um, megaton equivalents, which is way down, it's actually off this graph. So we have a, a ways to go. And the effect of the increasing carbon dioxide emissions is causing the green, um, greenhouse effects, heating up the, the, the globe and changing climates around the world. And there are multiple effects from this, changing of the water cycles, which are leading to increased or decreased rainfall, 
leading to floods and to droughts, as we have seen. Forest fires related to the higher temperatures and to the droughts. Changes in ocean temperatures, melting Arctic sea ice, rising sea levels, and increase in extreme weather events, such as the heat waves and storms and extremes in temperatures that we've been experiencing recently. So these changes on the left there, the climate impacts, um, are impacting human health. And we're seeing the impacts on physical health there um, with uh, changes in fitness activity level, heat-related illnesses, allergies even, increased exposure to waterborne and vector-borne, meaning in, uh, insects usually, illnesses. We're seeing also impacts on um, mental health as well. Um, stress, anxiety, depression, grief, a sense of loss, strains on social relationships, um, substance abuse, and even uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, especially with the situations like the wildfires where people are being evacuated from their homes as well. Um, and then we're seeing impacts on the health of communities as well. As communities are disrupted by these changes to infrastructure related to climate change, and people are displaced by the floods, by the fires, by the storms, and elsewhere in the world um, as being displaced by droughts and food and water insecurity as well. And with that community health change, we, uh, impacts we see increase in interpersonal aggression, more violence and crime, social instability, and the loss of community cohesion as well. Um, this is another way to view or to categorize some of the medical problems that are arising uh, from climate change, and we can see that there are problems related to pollution, wildfires, floods, uh, there are extreme temperatures, um, but also problems such as the mosquito-borne diseases, those vector-borne diseases, um, which are often seen more commonly in, in tropical climates, but as the our climate uh, heats up a little bit, we're starting to see more and more of those diseases in our areas. Diarrheal diseases as well that can um, occur with the disrupted water supplies during floods, um, and finally mental health and stress-related disorders, which Kyle will speak now about. Thank you, Linda. So I will be focusing on the mental health impacts of climate change, uh, the profound disturbances that we are seeing uh, these days. To begin with, I'll take this study that was published online in September 2021. It was done with 10,000 participants ages 16 to 25 across 10 countries. One of the lead authors is a Canadian researcher, Britt Ray, who I will talk about later. And the results were quite shocking and clear that 59% of people were extremely worried about the climate crisis, 84% were at least moderately worried, with over 50% feeling sad, helpless, guilty, and uh, powerless in these conditions. 45% um, said that the feelings about climate change had negatively impacted their daily functioning, and a large number felt that the government response was inadequate and they were being felt abandoned by the government. Um, I wanted to use a more recent study. It shows very similar results. This was published in the Journal of Cli Climate Change and Health in February of this year. 71% um, of people felt that um, they were angry at the government for their inaction. 78% said that they noticed a lot of the problems in the impact on their mental health and 69% felt that they were felt abandoned by the government's action. Um, so this talks a little bit about, um, this slide kind of talks about Britt Ray, the, the researcher I mentioned earlier. Dr. Ray was born in Toronto, and she's a postdoctoral fellow from the Stanford University and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, where she investigates the mental health consequences of climate change. Um, she's published widely in articles in the uh, Washington Times and the New York Times, uh, Washington Post, sorry, the New York Times, the Guardian, and Global Mail. And she's written a couple of books, uh, one of which I've kind of put out here. Uh, this was about the impact of climate change on mental health and her own personal struggles on having children in this day and age. She had to make a decision with her partner, which I think a lot of young people were kind of 
being affected by that and having to make you know, these very difficult choices that no one should have to think about. Um, this next study uh, talks about the concern steward effect and I think what, what it was done um, for students who are 16 years and older, 1,553 participants, and what they hypothesized was climate anxiety, social, uh, psychological distress, and pro-environmental behavior would be positively correlated, and that the effects of pro-environmental behavior on psychological distress would be stronger at lower levels. And, and basically the study found that, that people who um, had the concerns toward effects which described the increased engagement in pro-environmental behaviors were amongst those who were concerned and they acted. But when this, when the worry and the anxiety got too high, then their actions actually kind of were attenuated and they were struck by something what we call eco-paralysis, uh, behaviors that led to debilitating effects in the psychological distress. Um, this next slide is an article that was published on, in CBC and also talked about on CBC radio. Um, brings into our vocabulary around climate change is, is changing. Solastalgia is a word that was introduced by Glenn Albrecht. Um, he's a researcher from Australia in 2003 and what it describes is homesickness without leaving home. It's felt by people whose native lands or familiar environments are changing so fast. Um, as opposed to nostalgia, which we know of, which is the melancholia or homesickness experienced by individuals when separated from a loved home, which I'm sure some of you have gone through, if not all of you have gone through. Uh, so nostalgia is more about you are still, you're in the environment, you're, you're still connected to your home, but it's changing so quickly, the environmental change is impacting and the feeling like they're losing the home they knew, even though they're connected to it. Um, there are, I want to talk a little bit about post-traumatic stress disorder, that is old terminology, I think we all know what that is. Um, one in four people who have had to face a climate event have met screening criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder. And people who haven't directly had connection with an event are also showing signs of what we call pre-traumatic stress disorder now. Uh, and that the higher, higher, there's a higher prevalence amongst young people and women. And this was published in the Australian Journal of Psychiatry in 2022 in July. Um, another word called eco-anxiety has recently been added to the Oxford English Dictionary, where the term is defined as strong negative emotions associated with climate change that seep into everyday lives of those affected. I don't know if some of you are experienced that worry about what's going to happen. You know, this environment is changing so quickly. Uh, the last word here is symbiose. That is another word on point by Glenn Albrecht. He's a pretty prolific, uh, pro <laughs> prolific uh, Australian, at least. Uh, I don't know if you want to call it. Yeah, it's words for the dictionary. But um, it's the name he's given to our next epoch. The current one we are living in is the Anthropocene, where man has significantly affected our environment. And in this one, he's hoping that we can live with and be part of this world that we are living in, rather than affecting it in this negative way. And Linda will get to that in some of her later slides. Um, I wanted to mention some recommendations if you are interested in reading more about mental health and, and climate change. Uh, the Climate Psychology Alliance has an excellent website and they have a PDF handbook that offers short explanations, key concepts, um, and a lot of useful resources. Um, the other book is also a project, um, it's an anthology of 60 writings of women who have had various roles in the climate crisis. They're very inspirational if you read their stories. Uh, two of their stories, two of these stories, of course, focus on mental health. One of them is called Under the Weather by Ash Sanders, and the other one is The Adaptive Mind by Susan Moser. But I would say all of them are quite inspirational, from a lawyer fighting cold, frog, cold plants to indigenous people kind of forming communities, to, Pure, to uh, the people of Puerto Rico kind of coming together after the, after the floods and hurricanes and trying to make, you know, rebuild their land. So. 
going back to the handbook of climate uh, psychology, I wanted to just uh, use one of the examples, and, and the example that is highlighted here is a table on grief. Um, we know of a classic model of grief that was uh, done by groundbreaking work by Elizabeth Kubler Ross in 1969, where she talked of the five stages of grief. But that model doesn't really fit our current crisis because in that it was experiences of dying and not having to, not the experience of those who must survive the death and continue to live. So William Worthen's model here uh, has these various tasks and he, although he lists them in order, he talks about someone going through these various tasks and going back and forth between accepting, embracing and rejecting it, uh, trying, revisiting it and trying in the end to make sense and meaning, finding purpose and creativity in this, in this time of crisis. Another useful resource is the Good Grief Network. Uh, this was highlighted in Britt Ray's book. Um, it's a nonprofit organization started in the US by two women. Um, they have a 10-step program, meeting weekly in peer, 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 peer support groups where people come together and share and go through the steps involved over here. They also have a facilita facilitator training program. They have a journaling program now and one, a five-step program for youth, which I think is pretty good. I want to end by saying eco-anxiety is not a mental illness. Although some people would like to say, oh, you're just too worried, you need to go and take a medication for that. That's, eco-anxiety is real, and it's not a mental illness. What it is, though, it is a call to action. Uh, with that, I, I'm, I'm pretty proud to say that the Canadian Psychiatric Association has put forward this position paper. Um, these are really important guidelines that all psychiatrists across the country will at least look at at some stage in their career and hopefully implement and follow. So um, just touching on some of the points in this paper are that as Canadian mental health professionals, we should become climate literate. We should develop a framework to identify patients who are in need of help. We should pay attention to the disproportionate impact on indigenous people. We should take seriously the concerns of children and youth. Um, we should bring those practices into our own organizations. We should continue our education goals and research in this field. Um, we should get more active politically in climate advocacy and, uh, and activism at the institution and systemic levels. And we should be doing it individually at local, hospital and community levels, which is what has brought us here. Um, and lastly, also, as much as possible, divest from fossil fuel companies in our portfolios, in our investments, and encourage others to do so too. Uh, with that, I'll hand it back to Linda. Here's the good news, that further change in the climate is entirely present preventable, but we need to act now. We need to act quickly, and the climate will continue to change even if we brought our greenhouse gas emissions to zero today, because there is a bit of a lag effect there to change, but so we need to change as quickly as possible. The main action needed is to reduce our carbon footprint, um, to reduce emissions and to reduce uh, pollution. This generally means that we need to reduce consumption, reduce energy use, reduce consumption of goods as well. And you can see Canada is way up at the top there. We, we do pretty well in terms of consuming a lot. So we have a lot of work to do, a lot of, a, a lot of uh, room for improvement. Um, here is just a little bit of a selection, a smattering of actions that we can take. The micro is a kind of individual level, um, eating a more plant-based diet, less meat, it, it's a, a easier on the environment, reducing food waste, using bikes, um, uh, walking, um, public transit there, switching to greener uh, home heating sources, home energy sources if you can, um, and then, in general, just uh, saying no sometimes <laughs> to reducing consumption of goods and of energy. And then at the community level, or at the work level, uh, speaking up as community leaders, 
um, reducing your work and office footprint, sharing and teaching to the people around you, um, and there again, sharing at a, a more le a larger level. If somebody in your neighborhood or whatever in your community needs something that you have, using sharing it instead of everyone buying their own kind of thing. And then at the larger level, at the macro, the, sy uh, the system kind of footprint, um, trying to bring your voice to local, uh, municipal or provincial governments, uh, working towards policy change in general that will lower our footprint. Voting is an important one. Find out who the candidates are who are, are uh, running in the elections, which ones have a good planetary health uh, platform and vote for them. And then maybe even national networking to try and uh, inspire some change. Here's another way of looking at the kinds of ways that we can reduce our footprint. Um, you can see there, as, as Kai mentioned, making your money count, so uh, how you invest, how you spend your money, um, some of the things that we've talked about, switching to electrical uh, vehicle, but even better is using walk, bike, or take public transport up there, um, and reducing our waste. So the idea of reducing can feel threatening. Um, at times, that we'll have to give up some of the things that we really enjoy. But the trade-off is that there are health benefits to these changes, uh, improvements in how we feel physically and mentally. All of these changes would mean a new way of living, um, and new technology will help in providing some of us with greener, less emitting energy sources, but we need to go a little bit deeper than that. That won't be enough just to switch to new technology. We need a change in mindset and a change in our world view. And for that, we can look to the, the people who have lived in harmony with nature for millennia here, um, the indigenous people. They can give us some guidance um, in incorporating the concept of two-eyed seeing, as Albert Marshall, a Mi'kmaq elder, came up with. Two-eyed seeing refers to learning to see from one eye with the strengths of indigenous ways of knowing, and from the other eye with the strength of Western ways of knowing, and to use both of these eyes together. So here, uh, many indigenous people have a different worldview of their place in nature, not necessarily dominating as we see on the left there and destroying, <laughs> but recognizing how nature is actually the source of all life the source of air, water, and food, and that we need to take care of this, um, that all of this will actually be available for our children, for our grandchildren, and for our great-grandchildren. Dr. Shannon Waters is a public health physician, and she is uh, a Coast Salish um, uh, person too, and she writes that our ecosystems are our healthcare systems. We draw all of our sources of life from nature, from our ecosystems. We must protect those. The triangle there might represent what we were calling the Anthropocene, um, where humans kind of dominate the world, and this era is marked significantly by, this epoch is marked by our activities. We're seeing the results of that in the land and the oceans everywhere. But perhaps the, the right-sided circle there is what the symbiocene could look a little bit more like. Man did not weave the web of life. We are merely a strand in it. What we do to ourselves, what we do to the web, we also do to ourselves. So if we harm our environment, we are actually ultimately harming ourselves. And this was not the exact words, but close to what the Chief Seattle said a long time ago. <laughs> and another thing to remember is that climate change compounds the impacts of other events such as earthquakes, such as war, and many more events. And this is really important to consider when you're planning community resiliency. How do we manage a heat dome, or atmospheric rivers, or wildfires, if there's been an earthquake, or if there's militarized conflict, if there's a war going on, and you have these additional effects going on. So, and then from a health perspective, these consequences of the changing climate can also compound health problems too such as wildfire smoking with people who already have respiratory lung or heart problems too. Um, so I just wanted to end on one last comment. This is an era, these are 
things that humanity has never gone through before. It's a totally new age. We're coming up with ideas on how to manage this. And we really need to put all of our heads together and put all of our hands into and feet into action and come up, talk about this, share the ideas, figure out how we get through this in a good way. Thank you. So true. Thank you. What you're saying is totally makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, you feel hopeless about it. And where does that hopelessness come from, do you think? What? I mean, how can you change something while you don't do it? So what I hear from that is that we as people need to come together, we need to raise our voices together, and we need to say, this is not working for us. We want change. We're asking for change.